Welcome to Soul Night Live, episode number 70. Today we'll be discussing various Yes solo albums and Yes offshoots. My co-hosts are Henry Potts and Emmerich Leroy. This show is all about solo albums, um, and there are many of them. As a matter of fact, Rick has released over 100 on his own, I do believe. So today we're just going to talk about Rick's 100 solo albums and then come back. To, no, I'm just kidding. We picked a few, but uh, we're going to... So I think there's over 200 solo albums, of which about half are by Rick Bateman. <laughs> countless more offshoot projects, countless more guest appearances. Um, I've, I've been... Tr- I have a great love of, of tracking down all, all of these offshoots and I've been doing that for 30 years and there's plenty of albums I've, I've never even got to and plenty more being released every year. Um, uh, I help, I help run a, a website called Yescography that tries to track every album that a Yes member has ever appeared on. And there's, there's a lot, <laughs> which oh, is, you know, there's plenty, plenty to explore. If, if you're a Yes fan, if you're a Prog fan and, and, and you want to, um go off into the weeds there's a lot of interesting stuff you know there's some great solo albums and there's some great there's some great sort of unknown albums you know i found which i got because a yes member appeared on one track but you know the whole album is a is a joy okay the way i put this portion of the presentation together is first we're going to take a quick look at each of the first solo albums because as we know right around the time of relay or a little after that each guy in 76 went and did their own solo record and that's kind of what got the ball rolling you know rick had already done one but he was out of the band by then so let's take a peek at those first you know the, the one john did is a thing of legend you know uh, supposedly he locked himself in a garage with a bunch of keyboards and such and created Elias of Sun Hello, which is a song of the ancient or a story of the ancient times. And um, you know, it's, I'm not I'm hot and cold on a lot of John's solo stuff, but I think this one is really good. And in a way, I think this is one of the first new age albums before the term was coined. It has a similar kind of laid back, kind of cerebral quality that just kind of washes over you. It's not the most engaging listen but it's, it's a beautiful, sublime one. Anderson's Howls and Squire's solo albums from, from this 75, 76 period are, are fascinating because it's like a, a deconstructed yes. You can, you can hear what each of them is bringing to the band. You know, this is, this is, this is what John Anderson brings and it has, it has the, the, the epic symphonic nature that he was pushing the band to do with with tales with relay um but it doesn't have the the sort of instrumental virtuosity that you get saying steve house in but it but what it does have is 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 a a complicated soundscape you know john isn't you know can can play fine um but what he's doing is, and what took him so long, you know, this I think was the last of the solo albums to come out. Everyone else in their band is twiddling their thumbs, waiting for him to finish it. Um, it's, it's he's layering instrument upon instrument upon instrument in, in some quite interesting ways. Um, and of course, it's got this epic story um, based on the cover to Franchile. Yeah. The, the, uh... What is the name of the spaceship, the, his airship there, the, the Morglade? Oh, the Morglade, yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, yeah. For the longest, I thought it was a shining, flying purple wolfhound, but <laughs> I'm, I, I know better now. And I love the artwork. Uh, it's not Roger Dean, but it's kind of in that ballpark. Um, really, yeah, really John, nice. John wanted Roger, but Roger wasn't available for this. Wow. And they kind of fell out over this, I think, for a while. That's true. Uh, but I, I agree. It's, I mean, it's one of my favorites of the, of the, all the albums we're going to talk about. I think along with Chris Squires, it's one of the most uh, self-contained sort of musical worlds uh, that any solo Yes members were, was able to conjure up on a, on a solo record. And of course, John did it all on, on his own, whereas yeah. Squire assembled a 
fantastic band, but it's it was he received some outside help, and so on this one, what's fascinating is is that Anderson was able to put it off on his own, at least uh, in terms of, of uh, composing and, and and performing it. I mean, there was a guy called Mike Dunn who helped him with a lot of uh, of the technical aspects of it, but uh, so it's, it's quite a remarkable achievement. Yeah, yeah, it's it's awesome. Okay, and then speaking of awesome, um, this is arguably the greatest Yes solo album. Um, yeah, I mean, I we've got over two hundred Yes solo albums to pick from, but it's it's not that difficult to say. Well, what's the best one, or where should you start? You know, most people would say it is this album, Fish Out of Water, and and as I was saying. Um, it's it's not just Chris. I mean, it's very much led by Chris, and he's singing, uh, and he's composing all the material. But he's working with Andrew Price Jackman, who he was in the Sin with, who helps a lot with the arrangements. And, and Chris has always been very um, uh, open about that. Has always praised Andrew Jackman's work on it. And then it, and then he's got a band. He's got Bill Bruford back. Yeah. Um, somewhat unexpectedly, and and Patrick Moraz, although only on one track. Uh, he's got some other people playing. And it's and it's fascinating because this is this is what Chris brings to the band. He's got these th- long pieces, but but they're not 20 minute side epics. They're they're sort of seven, eight, nine minute pieces. They often have these um, the, these almost classical structures uh, helped by Andrew Jackman's arrangements. Um, it's, it's got a very clear influence from English church music. Um, it's got lyrics which are much more down to earth than John Anderson's. It's, it's a sort of quite humanistic, uh, often quite romantic love song stuff. Um, it's Chris as, as a lead vocalist. Uh, and I think very successfully. Oh yeah, it sounds fantastic. Uh, great album. Yeah, really wonderful. Um, Hold Out Your Hand is just a super catchy tune with an amazing bass line. Um, Lucky Seven with the... Uh, Lucky Seven with uh, the road. Fender yeah. Rhodes, yeah. That's just such a wonderful little odd metered pop nugget. Um, and, and he is, he's, he's playing some guitar on it, but it is a, a bass guitar driven album, which is... Very much, yeah is you know still quite an unusual thing to have something where the melody is driven by by the bass guitar right but make no mistake it isn't your typical bass player solo record you know if that was the case it'd be an hour of the fish but yeah but he's he's very much a bass and uh, and vocalist as well i mean it's the two things uh, I mean, there's a lot of instrumental uh, moments on there, but it's it's really uh, songs primarily, but uh, ex- arranged in a more expansive manner. Uh, as a side note, uh, I was listening uh, not so long ago to a solo album, quite a so- uh, an obscure solo album by the lead singer of Gracious called Sandy Davis. And Andrew Jackman is uh, is doing the arrangement on the, on that. And it's quite recognizably his. I mean, the music isn't terribly uh, exciting or prog, but you can tell just by listening to uh, Jackman's arrangements that there's, there was something quite unique about the way you arranged orchestras. And uh, as Henry pointed out, is a, is very much uh, is a big part of what made this album successful. And actually, when Squire was asked whether he'd do a, a sequel to it. Uh, Jackman was always part of the equation in his mind and when Jackman died I think in 2003 that really meant there, there would never be a proper solo up to it. No, and there exactly. wasn't. I mean this was almost a, a thing of, of legend and, and joke you know for the longest. I'm going to do a follow up one of these days you know. And so, so Chris for a long period Chris did say he was doing a follow up album and that eventually came out as um, Conspiracy credited to him and Billy Sherwood. Yeah, and to me that does not project. feel like a proper follow-up though. That seems like no. a completely new band with a new attitude and angle. Um, but 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 that long period where Chris is saying, yeah, yeah, I'm working on something, that is what he was talking about. That was about. it, yeah. So the Although proper it, 
the proper follow up to this album never came. Yeah. You know, so it well, uh, the proper follow up to it is drama, you could say. <laughs> That's you a know, good it, way of putting it. In some ways, I hear a lot of connection between between this and and drama, where again it's Chris writing these these bass heavy songs with these sort of eight minute arrangements yeah um great stuff uh, essential um steve howe's solo album maybe not quite as essential um i find his albums at least in this time period were an interesting hodgepodge of ideas um it you know unlike chris's album which really flows and hangs together as a whole steve's is like all these little vignettes strung together would you yeah, guys agree with that i was i was talked about this i mean elias and fish out of water are very coherent cohesive albums how's first this album and, and his next one there they are hodgepodges you know which is partly you know what he brought to the band whereas steve howe these days, you know, for, and, and perhaps for the last two decades, Steve has approached the solo albums has been very cohesive, an album with a particular approach and style. So it's right. interesting how how has switched to that and how has talked about how he's gone from these um, mixes to these very focused albums, like like Time is the album with with a string section. Sure. Love it as its own style, turbulence as its own turbulence style. Turbulence very much. Yeah, so we'll talk a bit about that one coming up soon. So nice. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the, the good thing he did between this and the second one is that he decided it, he wouldn't sing quite as much on it. I mean, there's much too much uh, singing on this album. Uh, mm. and I mean, quite famously, he, he's a ter terribly good vocalist. Uh, so my favorite material on this and, and the follow-up is the more classical oriented uh, material like the this the, the title track on this and uh, the 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 last two tracks on the on the second album that are in the same vein mm -hmm. and on this I would I would also uh, point out the um, the the track he did with the Griffin guys uh, that stands out a bit it's a nice instrumental. But for me, uh, the rest is really spoiled, not just by the uh, is, is, uh, is thing of, of uh, putting together as many different guitars as possible on, a, on this multi-track, uh, but the, the amount of singing is, uh, is really problematic. You know, how, is, great, though. how is acknowledged? I mean, how has said there were, he said, he said there were too many yes men around him, not in the sense of people in yes, but too many people say, yeah, you can do it, you can sing. And, and he's acknowledged that was a problem with the album. And he does cut back on the second album. And mm. most of his subsequent work, he's large. He's often steered away from singing. Although right. also what he's done in recent years is go and get singing lessons, as he said. And I think he is a better singer now than he was. I was going to point that out, you know, starting with the grand scheme of things, I think that's a, a really um, cool vocal album where the vocals actually work. Um, we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. So, um, And story of a golf tee. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but it does kind of look like a golf ball sitting on a tee there. Uh, this is the story of I from Patrick Moraz, and it's maybe the most eclectic and adventurous of these records. Uh, eclectic, a lot of uh, Brazilian influence, um, a weird concept story that no one entirely understands. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a strong album. And pr predominantly instrumental, unlike the next one. So uh, there's, there's a lot of wonderful keyboard playing in there. It is, it's very Patrick. It's, it's all over the place, really, but it's fascinating in its virtuosity and, uh, and the sheer amount of, of keyboards on it is, is, is quite enjoyable. Uh, of course, the the lineup involved is quite interesting as well. Jeff Berlin on bass, we already mentioned him. Alphonse Mouzon and uh, Andy Newmark, I think, sharing the drumming. Uh, the vocals are a bit weak, I would say, uh, but there's plenty of, of exciting instrumental stuff. I think I read somewhere that some of it at least was 
intended for the second refugee album that never happened yeah but the more, more conventional prog part of it but as you said there's uh, an element of uh, south american percussion that is uh, that makes this album quite unique as well and it was it was Mraz who introduced Bruford to Berlin I yeah cuz uh, cuz when Moraz and Bruford met as part of the Chris Squire recording sessions uh, it was it was Patrick who told him of this new uh, wonderful bass player it, it found in uh, in Brooklyn and uh, the rest is history yeah good move good move all right and then here's maybe the least hailed of the five solo albums, the original ones. You know, this is one where I heard forever, you know, it doesn't sound like Yes. And I heard the silly woman on Yes Years. And I thought, well, you know, if this is just a bunch of reggae wannabe stuff, I don't really care. But I picked up a copy of this recently and I was pleasantly surprised. It really had more to do or reminded me more of the likes of Santana meets a little bit of Frank Zappa. Um, so yeah i mean it's i i like it as an album it's it's not really an alan white solo album it's an album by uh the band he'd been working with before yes which we could call griffin um it the, the band went through a number of lineup changes and and a number of different names but it's really alan has no writing credits on the album even though he was contributing uh, writing to yes and, and and has in other album projects in more recent years um and it does have song of innocence which is this uh wonderful piece using uh lyrics from a william blake poem with steve howe and john anderson guesting so so that's your track which does sound quite yes like right yes he almost kind of yes meets elias you know that's what i yeah. hear it's almost it's kind of another new agey kind of, of of track but it's really beautiful a lot of people play it at their weddings when yes fans get married um that's the the song to play <laughs> yeah but certainly uh, as part of our discussion of how these albums uh give us insights into each member's contribution to yes this has absolutely no interest in that sense i mean it's completely not uh, really but i think with different thing. i think it could very much surprise people that are only familiar with alan's drumming in the 80s and beyond to hear him play some of these latin rhythms i'd never heard him do that before so it was it was quite enlightening in that aspect to hear another yeah i mean there playing. are there are some other 70 sessions alan did which I think you, you you do hear similar. Yeah, so uh, I think this just shows there's more to Alan White than we realize just hearing him with yes. So it's cool in that regard. That's, I've completely forgotten their name. The, the music machine, the Johnny Armand music machine, was that it? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Mark, got Mark Armand. That's got some great playing by Alan on it. That's very early, right? It's 69 or something? Uh, um. Or 68 even? Uh, no, it's... It's very early, certainly, for Alan. Yeah. I, I've got, I it, I've got it here. I, could, I should check. But... Yeah, look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got it on my iTunes. But, uh... but yes, Rick Wakeman, the, the, who's done so many solo albums, misses out on being in Yes in the one period when everyone got to do a solo album. Right, but this this one predates those, yeah. am I right? He did this when he was still with Yes right before he left, am I right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's one of his finest, and if you want to know what Rick Wakeman is about as a solo artist, this is the album to start with. A um, few reasons I like it. Um, for one thing, you know, it's before a lot of really awful-sounding keyboards were invented, and he got his hands on them. And it's all the better for that because all you get to hear is piano, Mellotron, Moog, Hammond. And those are timeless sounds that never get old. Um, you know, a few years down the road, poly Moogs and all these other things, ah, you know, they, those can kind of grate on my nerves, but this is just a beautiful classic sounding prog album. Um, and each piece is sculpted really beautifully. 
And then the opening cut has the guys from Yes on it, I believe, including Bruford. Bruford, I think Alan's on one track and Bruford's is on another. And no, then... Alan is on more tracks. Bruford is only on that bit, which was recorded while he was still in the band. It's not him guesting on a on a Rick Wakeman album post his departure. Right. Uh, so it was made over the period when when Bruford was replaced by White, but it's mostly White on the album. Am it's I right that the, tracks, that first piece that opens this album? Rick wanted to put that on Fragile, but he couldn't, so he had to do Cans and Brahms instead. Yeah, because A&M wouldn't let him do an original piece. He had to to make an arrangement of someone else's music to be allowed to to contribute a solo track. Well, that really would have added a lot of extra energy to Fragile. Not that it needed more, but you could just imagine having that on there yeah, as a second it's track. Yeah, better than Cans and Brahms. Yeah, yeah and it's an especially cool. strong Wakeman compositions, because I, I was going to to say that, I mean, I don't rate Rick very highly as a composer. I rate him much highly, much more highly as a as an arranger of other people's music, and as especially what he brought to Fragile was fantastic in that sense. Sure. And uh, that that bit at the start of the Six Wives, the bit that started these solo showcase on the live gigs as well, is really strong. And uh, there's nothing on. I mean, there's very little on that album or subsequent albums that are, that is as focused and as uh, interesting to me. There's a lot of pretty banal music uh, in a lot of his albums, I think, uh, including this one. So it's, I mean, it's not even my favorite Rick really? Wakeman album. Interesting. Okay. Interesting choices, I think, about this album. Um, you know, if you're going to do a solo album and you're not a vocalist do you get a vocalist in or not and so this is an instrumental album whereas some of his later albums rick does get vocalists in and often often gets criticized for some other odd choices and not very good vocalists. Yeah. well like this one maybe like yeah, this. he gets two on this one <laughs> two, di two different and they're equally uh, problematic i would say um, uh, and also we see this thing where i mean rick has talked about how um he gets inspired by having a concept. He likes to have a concept. So the Six Wives, Henry VIII, or, or here based on the Jules Verne novel, he likes to immerse himself in the concept. And then that fuels, he says, his creativity. Sure. Um, and, and we get this succession of big, bombastic, frog concept albums. Um, you know, so Journey to the Center of the Earth, you, you, you have to give it its dues for its um, ambition, its scope, um, you know, it's got an orchestra, it's, it's this giant concept album trying to summarize a whole novel. Right, right. and this is- Whether the... it actually works is another matter. I mean, I think a lot of this album is just tedious and boring. I think this and some of the follow-ups are the epitome of prog rock excess <laughs> that people talk about so many years later. You know, yeah. this one wasn't on ice. That was King Arthur, which we'll talk about in a minute. But this one was done at the Crystal Palace. And as you can see from some of those pictures I unearthed recently, you know, it's a little band shell out in the middle of kind of a, a meadow forest area. Um, and everybody kind of gathers around the lake and, and watches it. Um, and this is the one where Rick said, you know, he had inflatable sea monsters and they started to deflate right in the middle of the show. So there's just a couple kind of, withering blobs out there in the middle of the thing which is so spinal tap but you know not surprising you know yeah, the worst is i think that's when he had his uh his heart attack right after that gig or the day after or he, he was he, he had really bad health issues just following yeah. this concert at and i know Palace. he like spent all his money putting these shows on so that's one of the reasons he wound up back in yes is because he was broke yeah. and he needed the money um there's a lot of rock excess. He's drinking heavily as well. Yeah. And then we get uh, Missing Legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Um, this other big concept album, he he wants to do it live. He, he wants to book this uh, venue to do it, but he finds out that they've got an ice show just before, just after. And he's like, oh, okay, we'll leave it as an ice rink and I'll do an ice show. <laughs> and then you get this infamous performance where the band are in the middle of this ice rink and then people are skating around like Arthurian knights acting out 
Yeah. There's a DVD of that. I, I, I didn't really, I didn't know until recently that there was actually a DVD of it. And it was as, as comical as I expected it to be. <laughs> oh, I haven't seen that. I've seen the deflating sea monster. I've seen some footage of that, but I've never seen this. So, you uh, know, and I think Rick is not, not unhappy with it in a sense being comical. Possibly no. it's when it slips into visible rather than comical, if we can make that distinction. Um, right. I mean, I think I think the album has has a few good points. Uh, you know, there's 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 some nice pieces on here. I think it's um, Merlin the Magician was used by many years for general election coverage in the UK by uh, BBC. And that popped up in his solo spot occasionally too. And it's a really yeah. quick paced, almost kind of ragtimey kind of thing. Yeah, that is a lot of fun. Um, that's probably yeah. the standout for me. It's like this one and this album as well. I don't know if I can really take them in one sitting, but there are isolated tracks that I find. Really I think cool. we should say these albums were huge. They sold really well. They sold massively more than any John Anderson solo album, any Steve Howe solo album, any Chris Fire solo album. You know, these are huge, big sellers. Um, they made a lot of money. Um, they were, was Journey number one in the UK, I think? Yeah. Or, yeah, I think that's uh, there's a story that he heard he was number one the day he decided to leave Yes and didn't rejoin them for the rehearsals for what became uh, Real Air. Mm. Uh, I should add that uh, Rick did uh, rem remakes of these uh, albums, I mean, The Journey and The Myths of Legends, and, and Legends uh, recently, and I think they are quite strong uh, counterparts to those original albums. Uh, there's some extra material, and it was, uh, I heard them recently and they were quite pleasant and, and in some way improvements on the originals. I'm rather fond the, the vocals are really weak, I think, on this. Although, Although the main reason for doing the re-records was he doesn't make any money from these, yeah. these versions. He, to settle a tax bill, all the, all the royalties from these go to the UK government. You know, the one I liked was the uh, live DVD of him doing Six Wives um, at Henry's palace you know the one i'm talking about yeah yeah what's the name of henry the eighth's palace i'm trying to remember Hampton of course. Yeah. that's right that's right okay and what's the name of henry potts's palace <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm saddened not to have um quite the same then this is a later one that usually gets mentioned right after Six Wives as being one of his more concise albums. And it also has Chris and Alan guesting, which gives it a little bit of extra oomph, although I almost wouldn't guess it was them if I didn't know. Um, What's interesting is, is so, so half the album, one side has Chris and Alan, and they, they didn't recall together. He said to Chris and Alan, you know, give me some stuff. Um, and they recorded parts, and then he recorded his parts on top. Oh, hmm. well, there's Which, a couple of tunes on there. I think "Statue of Justice" is one of the yeah. ones that, that's pretty pretty cool. And the Judas Iscariot is the long track that has a lot of the same atmosphere as "Awaken" because it, it uses yeah. uh, uh, the uh, church organ from Veve and uh, and all those synthesizers. So it's quite a nice addition if you if you if you listen to "Awaken" and want to have a bit more of the same atmosphere and same kind of sounds and the choir as well. It's, it's quite a pleasant listen. It's probably, I mean, it's certainly one of my favorite Rick albums. Yeah, there's good stuff. And there's also a bit of the comical Rick that came along later. I'd say the breathalyzer is the father to, I'm so straight, I'm a weirdo. <laughs> Not too much of a stretch because some of Rick's rather comical tunes. Um, it, it's interesting that I'm so straight, I'm a weirdo, was Rick has explicitly said was an attempt to uh, do what the Buggles had done. Uh, well, not so successfully. but uh, Not so successful. We've <laughs> now skipped about 20 solo albums. Ah, uh, well, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Rick, no experience, uh, no, what's it called? Um, the, the spacey one. Um, no, no earthly connection. No earthly connection. I think no it was the original. I think that's the, the other Rick Raymond album from the seventies that's that's worth a listen. But yeah. then by the time he gets into the eighties, 
there's some albums with some okay stuff on them you know 1984 into the future you know i i can listen to but there's a lot of mediocre stuff the family album was not bad the tune that he wrote for the rabbit wiggles was a favorite <laughs> he does a lot of he he starts changing style you know so he's got rock albums he does some ambient albums he does some sort of more instrumental albums He's, he's doing a lot of albums, I think, often driven by the need to generate income. Sure. Uh, and they're often on small labels. And this, Return to the Center of the Earth, this was a sort of big comeback album. He's got a big label behind him. He's got lots of big name guests, Patrick Stewart narrating, Trevor Rabin guests on, on One Piece. Ozzy. And yes, I don't think it's particularly good. You know, uh, It's not my favorite. It, it... It, the sum of the parts are greater than the end result. I think um, the tune with Ozzy uh, is kind of predictable. It's not unlike some of the stuff Ozzy was doing at the time. And Ozzy, and Rick played on a few of Ozzy's albums. He had an album called Osmosis that Rick played on uh, around the same time. I think so. It's okay. You know, it's it's it's. It, yeah, know, I mean, I, I mentioned it just because of of the fact that Trevor's guesting on it. So that's kind of of interest to yes fans, I guess. I'd, I'd take some of these more obscure albums like Into the Future um, over Return to the Center. Oh, yeah. And, and then, then we have this most recent album where Rick has sort of gone back to his roots. He said, you know, another big concept album. Um, all uh, instrumental. All instrumental, deliberately proggy in style um, and had very good reviews, uh, been very well received. I mean, I not a huge fan of a lot of Rick's solo work and I think this is not you know if you like Rick this is this is Rick being very Rick yeah um, minus you don't like Rick well it's kind of minus fun. the silliness it's minus the cheesy 80s keyboard sounds um you know it's more uh the palette he's working with is more classic I mean there are some modern keyboard sounds on here too but there's lots of wonderful ripping Moog solos you know that we turn to him for anyway so yeah uh, it's kind of the best we can expect from him at this point and yeah it's, it's, it's quite, like it's really wives, well, this is a good one well we we've skipped over you know he's done some recent piano solo piano albums often mainly consisting of covers which have sold very well uh, in the uk have done well in the charts and which oh, i quite enjoy. like rick as a as a pianist as an arranger you know they're they're not bad in places. It's funny. I used to work at a bookstore about 20 years ago, and I used to play one of his piano albums over the PA. And I remember I had a lady come to me and complain that it was too busy. And it was hard for her to shop because she couldn't concentrate because it was. I said, that's virtuosic stuff, lady. Don't you get it? <laughs> anyway, I'm moving on from Rick. Um, John's second album was kind of a different affair than uh, Elias, more of a hodgepodge of songs, some of which were slated for Tormato, but didn't make it. Um, and yeah, I, know, I have mixed feelings about this album. There's a few tracks I kind of like, but I don't really love anything on it. This is John's sort of first post Yes album, and, and there's material here that he had uh, offered to Yes and hadn't been used. So this is kind of giving us some idea of how the direction yes could have gone in um i like a lot of john's solo albums you know i think uh, i'd take your average john solo album over your average rick solo album um even maybe over your average steve solo album um it's got some good stuff it is a bit of a mix it's not bad as jack bruce guesting on a track or two i believe and um yeah, around the same time that Jack and Simon Phillips were playing with Trevor Rabin on his, on his own solo album. So there's a, an early connection there, but it was like musicians who played a lot of sessions anyway. So there's no particular, it's not particularly revealing coinci uh, coincidence. Uh, this uh, this album I, I quite like. I think it's quite, it's it's a pleasant listen. It's it's very light music, apart from maybe the uh, the epic Song of Seven, but even that is is quite is quite soft in style. But uh, I mean, it's it's got John at, at his prime vocally and uh, and some rather nice melodies. Uh, 
I believe this was reissued recently. I this think. was reissued yeah. recently and about to be reissued recently is his next album, which I think might be my favorite. Which one is that? Animation. Ah, uh, now you're talking. Yeah, this is one that never got a proper uh, release on CD. They literally just took some bad fifth generation version and threw it on a CD and everyone cried foul for obvious reasons. Um, but this is a really cool tour. Uh, also, you know, he put together a really killer band with the likes of David Sanctious on keyboards, who will ironically be my guest tomorrow afternoon. And we'll be sure to talk about this album and tour. Um, and Clem cool Clemson stuff. on guitar. Yeah. yeah. And it yeah. kind of points to 80s yes to me in a way. There's a kind of an 80s sound going on here with some of these tunes. It is quite a poppy album. Um, but but I think it's John at his hoppy best. It's It's got great melodies. It's got lots of energy. Um, I love it. Yeah, I really love the opening track, Olympia. I think that's a, a standout, a really catchy tune. And yeah, the tour, Yeah, if you can find a, a boot of that, definitely worth checking out. The two medleys they did of Yes songs are rival the big medley that Yes did on the Tarmato tour. It's that kind of thing, but different um so yeah really cool stuff um and then i point out this one you know there's a lot of different ones that john did in the following years but this one always seems to get quite a bit of love and um it's very 80s very slick kind of plastic production um i believe chris guests on some of this though am i right no, yeah. no. no it's toto basically backing him I don't think anyone from Yes is on it. Chris guests on a video. On the video for Hold On to Love, where he pretends to play the stand-up bass. That's right. But he's not on the album. I get it. No wonder I'm confused. <laughs> but Bizarre. Yeah. Do you guys like this album? For what it is, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting in the in, in the context of uh, John being. Uh, supposedly uh, dissatisfied with Yes not being proggy enough and soon <laughs> going off to form ABWH. So it's it's always fun to listen to it uh, with that in mind. But for what it is, I mean, it's it's got, again, John, John singing uh, fine and, uh, and, and, and good melodies, but it's a very pop and very 80s album. Yeah, it's not much yeah. prog to be had here. But... Yeah, no, I agree completely. It, it is, it's... It's an attempt to turn John into a, into the next Phil Collins or something. Ha, good um, luck. But, I'm, gonna but, skip, I'm gonna skip ahead far and just kind of cut to the chase and talk about his most recent one, which was new, but it wasn't really new new. It was some tra uh, tracks that he recorded around the time of Union, I think, or around early '90s. Yeah, just had, the had Chris and Alan play on some of those. And then they were left in his garage and a producer friend recently, and maybe three years ago said, Hey, do you still have those tapes? And John's like, yeah, I think so. So he gave them to him and the producer's like, Hey, you know, I could get Ian Anderson to play flute on this song. Go for it, do it. You know? And so it goes with many different guest stars, probably more guest stars than I've ever seen on anybody's solo record. John's, narrative for this album is slightly odd because you know he talks about doing these recordings and then they get forgotten about but he did the album with brian chatton who um he'd been with in the warriors uh chatton was also in um i think it was in uh Brian. yeah and uh, and uh, the first phil collins group as well uh what's it called flaming youth yeah that was him too, yeah. So, so Chatton, you know, has had an okay career here and there. Um, and so Chatton wrote the music with, with Anderson doing lyrics and, and maybe vocal lines. And, and for years, Brian Chatton was talking about, yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to get the album out sometime. So, so it wasn't forgotten. And it, and it slightly, it was never quite clear what happened because this, this eventual reemergence of the material, Brian Chatton wasn't particularly involved with, although he's been supportable. And then it does also have some newer material on it, uh, where he's worked with Michael Franklin, um, the producer. And I think it's I think it's a good album. Um, I, I think the 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 tracks from around 1990, um, 91 or whenever, 
they, you know, John was doing good work back then. They, they sound like some of the yes material around then. I mean, bits of this sound like the ladder to me, actually. Um, and then some of the new stuff, Michael Franklin is a good producer, puts, puts together ideas. Um, it's, it is all very John. You know, it's got some wacky lyrics, it's, yeah, but it's got lots of good melodies. Yeah, I like that tune, Rama Lama. That's a, a pretty catch one. And, you know, John has a way of overdubbing a whole little symphony of him doing dit, dat, dat, dit, dit, dit kind of things. And <laughs> that happens on here on that. And I think it's really cool. It kind of reminds me of the acapella intro to Big Generator, that, that kind of little choir of little voices doing phonetic sounds. Um, John yeah. does that very well. And I like it when he does that. So moving on from John Anderson. Well, almost. We, we should mention a couple of the albums he did with Van Gallis, I believe. Um, so he meets Van Gallis. He tries to get Van Gallis into Yes, and, and that doesn't really work out. But they, they strike up this friendship. And, and John has talked about how uh, inspirational he found Van Gallis. Van Gallis would just start playing. John would start singing over it. And John says, you know, a lot of this material just sort of appeared very rapidly from that. And that must have been a different experience for John compared to a, the lengthy process that Yes would go through to arrange material. Yeah. I mean, I, I think he talked about how he would improvise some, uh, some melodies and some uh, lyrics that didn't particularly mean anything and then would rewrite them in a more uh, rational way, keeping some of what sounded nice. Much, much the same way he did with uh, with Yes, but as you said, it, it was mo mostly spontaneous, especially this album. I think it became a bit less spontaneous with the succeeding albums, beginning with Private Collection, yeah. I think especially it, the last one they did. I think it's worth mentioning Van Gelis's, um Heaven and Hell album, which is a, a great Van Gelis sort of prog concept album, which John guests on, and, and you know, that's one of my favorite John and Van Gelis pieces although it's yeah. not under the john evangelist name it's just under the evangelist name well he was included on the on the later best of collections right mm. so long ago so clear yeah that's a very nice song the, the really weird john evangelist stuff though is that evangelist used to be in a band with demis russos who, who became this um this 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 figure almost of ridicule in in society as a, as, a, as a romantic balladeer and there's a couple of John and Vangelis written songs that got sung by Demis Roussos and that bizarre because Roussos has a completely different voice to Anderson but you can hear this is a song that Anderson wrote um, you, they're worth tracking down for their bizarrity and are these songs we have versions of by John and Vangelis or, or? Uh, no, uh, well, yes. So, so one of them is, uh, a vocal version of Chariots of Fire. Oh yeah. Where we have Chariots of Fire as Vangelis instrumental. We don't have John, a John version from then, but in more, uh, in recent years, he put out a version, um, with the lyrics of him singing. So you do have that comparison point. Interesting. The other one I, I found, uh, there doesn't seem to be a, a, a John version, um, but it's credited, in fact, just as written by John Anderson. And you hear it, and Demi Sousos cannot sing like John Anderson, but you can hear for like half a second him trying to, and you go, oh, this is a John Anderson song. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah, that's very interesting. I can't imagine the lyric or content. They're running real fast. <laughs> They're running real fast. Uh, yeah, running more. real fast right down the beach. <laughs> there you go. Now, I'm the guy that wants to put lyrics to King Crimson's Red to also, though, so don't listen to me. And don't even ask me to sing that one. Anyhow, uh, this picture offers a tantalizing glimpse of what it would look like if John collaborated with Fernando Perdomo. <laughs> um, and it's funny Fernando actually on the cruise to the edge uh, people had been known to pull him by and ask him if he was Van Gallus's son <laughs> which is kind of funny 
but anyhow, any thoughts on this one? I remember the title track, the melody is copped from some classical piece, but I never have been able to put my finger on exactly which one it is. But um, I think it's worth noting that, again, we have a certain amount of commercial success here. You know, I'll find my way home in particular did well as a single. Um, and I think it's, you know, gratifying for John Anderson that he can be a success outside Yes, and, and he was with this. And he's also very proud of supposedly uh, the, the synth bass line on the title track, supposedly being an influence on Michael Jackson for Billy G. Mm. Oh, that big splatty keyboard bass sound. Yeah, yeah. I, I could see that. Well, I think it was just a popular keyboard sound at that time. But Well, I think, I think John argued that he was told by a producer that it was an actual influence. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's neat. And... It should be noted that the original demo of Owner of a Lonely Heart had a similar splatty uh, synth bass line as well. Um, if you break out 90124, that's bow, 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 you know, that kind of sound, which is yeah. so 80s, so 80s. Um, so moving on, we'll get a little bit into the Bruford area. Uh, you know, there are a handful of Shit. Well, there's many yes offshoot groups, and I would say one of the most glorious and successful uh, was UK. The album. Well, whether it's it's actually a yes offshoot is debatable. Oh well, yeah, he did his own thing and had been out of yes for a few years by yes. then. So been... UK is a King Crimson offshoot. UK was going to be a King Crimson reunion, and then Robert Fripp pulls out. Yeah, and... it, would, it would have been very different had Fripp been in it. Yeah. Uh, so that's where, I mean, it's it, even before that, it started out as uh, Rick Wakeman, John Wetton, and Bill Bruford. I mean, 30 years on that album was first played with, with Wakeman. So uh, it's it's kind of, I mean, it's a descendant of that rather than, than anything to do with Yes, really. I mean, Bruford's compos uh, contribution as a composer is not so huge that there's a, the spirit of Yes is really represented in this still i mean uh in in its own right it's it's uh, it's a great band and and such such a, a an awesome uh gathering of uh, of musical talent in there very a, true a great a great band but i i always struggle and i don't know why with the album i mean i think uk the band and the live recordings from the tour for this album are absolutely fantastic some of the some of the best prog music around, sort of a sort of culmination of a lot of 70s prog. You know. But but the studio album lacks something for me. I, I don't know, it doesn't quite capture what they had live. Well, it's it's quite clinical, because uh, the way I understand it, it, it was put together with everyone recording separately. So it, it does sound that way a bit. But... Um, for me personally, it doesn't really detract from the album being great. I mean, it, it, it was it was arguably a breath of fresh air for prog at the time with all the uh, Ed, Eddie Jobson's synthesizer sounds, which worked quite well and won the old Mellotrons and Ammon organs. I mean, it, there was much more Ammon organ on the next album, actually, the one without yeah, Bruford on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a very valid band, although you could wonder whether the, the mixture of jazz rock and prog worked in the long term. In, in, in that band certainly didn't work in the long term because Oldsworth and Bruford quickly left and there was no... Yeah, so, so UK basically splits in half. Half Wetton and Jobson continue as UK and Bruford and Oldsworth form Bruford. True. <laughs> Speaking of which... <laughs> and you know it's a series of three different albums um well two really and a third one that's a slightly different but um i think uh for starters i think the uk album is one of the greatest late 70s prog albums you know it's like everybody else was kind of in a tailspin or like king crimson they just packed up and went home <laughs> before the half second half of the 70s came along so I think this is a, a shining example of how good prog could still be in the right hands. And it also kind of reminds me of what ELP could have become if they didn't go to Love Beach and run out of gas in the middle of works 
which is how I perceive it. Um, you know, anyhow, uh, this is more a uh, fusion group than um, a prog group, I would say. Yeah. But I think there's a lot here to enjoy if you are a prog fan, you know. The... And most, most importantly, it's, it's Bill's debut as a composer. And he'd always written bits of ideas for Yes and for King Crimson. I mean, for Yes, there's Heart with Sunrise, which he gets a, a writing credit for. Uh, King Crimson, he didn't contribute so much musically, and it didn't, it didn't actually write complete pieces at the time. And when he started doing so, uh, he, he tried to form a band, which was what happened with uh, Jeff Berlin in 75, uh, which we discussed before. And uh, this was Bill for the first time composing most of the music on an album. Of course, one should mention that he is very ably aided on this by uh, Dave Stewart, keyboard player who he'd been, he'd been playing with in, in, in National Health, one of the bands he was in between Crimson and, uh, and UK, uh, as well as Genesis. And uh, well, Jeff Berlin is still there uh, and Alan Oldsworth playing guitar. So that's a fantastic combination of people, uh, musicians. Uh, it's quite a bit different to the next album in that the, I would say the keyboards are a bit uh, less prominent uh, and also uh, uh, less synthesizers. Uh, there would be more on one of a kind. Uh, and this album is also quite unique because of uh, Kenny Wheeler playing flugelhorn and uh, Annette Peacock doing uh, the singing on it. So it's, it's quite unique within the Bruford series of albums. Also, Bruford's playing mallets on this, you know, Beelzebub. That's all him playing. I don't know if it's a xylophone or a marimba, one or the other. But quite impressive, you know. Um, and... He didn't do any more of that after this, but for a moment there, he had some chops. And yeah, there's a bit more vibes playing, mallet playing on the, on one of a kind, and then it stops completely and never to return. Yeah. And one of a kind is basically all instrumental. There's no Annette, there's no singing. There's just an interesting kind of little spoken word intro on one of the songs for Fainting in Coils, which is yeah. a little extra. Sam, Sam Adler, the uh, King Crimson manager, is doing one of the voices. Okay. Yeah, it's quite, uh, quite uh, ironical. Alice in and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Surprisingly, I think I'm, I'm right in saying that Jeff Berlin gets the credit for lead vocals on the album despite not singing, but I might be wrong. Well, don't worry. He'd make good on that soon enough. And yeah, I know. <laughs> that's where it happens here. Um, his rather Jack Bruce inspired vocals are on about half this record. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's an acquired taste, but then again, the nets were as well. You know, you have as many people that say, I love those as the ones that say they don't. So I think at the end of the day, Bruford is best with no vocals at all, personally. <laughs> but yeah, I, I love these albums when I, when I first heard them, but maybe it's just me, but these days revisiting them, I, I, I don't think they compare well to UK. I, I think they've lost something. And I think Buford matured as a composer uh, in, into the next phase of his career with Earthworks and, and subsequently. Oh, absolutely. So um, and how about this one, the Moraz Buford collaborations that happened in the 80s? Well, I, I, I quite like this first album because it sticks to the concept that was defined for it, which is music for piano and drums. I think what got problematic with Flags was when it stopped being just piano and drums. But this was an interesting project. Uh, I don't think it has much relevance within the context of Yes, despite it being done by two former members of Yes. So it's, it's of course, it's a draw for Yes fans to listen to it, but uh, uh, I think it, it should be taken for what it is. Uh, and it's it's a fine uh, uh, album of, of I mean, Moraz is a, is a, is a, is a great pianist. Uh, there was little, uh, too little uh, solo piano on his solo, solo albums. So it's great hearing him just playing piano and Bruford playing acoustic drums. So that that's, remains my favorite of the two by far. Very nice. Well, while we're talking about Moraz, I thought I would throw in one of his albums. You know, this is the one that has the tune that has a similar chord cycle as Awaken. 
Yeah, which which I guess is evidence that he actually composed the intro. I mean, there's certainly a way for him to uh, to claim the intro as his own, which I think is called "Time to Fly," and it's it's uh, actually the bit they were playing uh, at a Reading Festival in '75. Uh, just oh. on its own, the intro. Oh, right, the, uh, the high vibration high go vibration. on first yeah. part. Yeah, just those kind of descending chords, not but, any of the masters of images or any of that. that, that yeah, but other than that, I mean, it's it's <clears throat> mostly the same guys as the first I mean, in the story of I, but it's much more song-based. And uh, apart from that suite, which is a sort of a nine-minute suite, which begins with what we just mentioned, uh, it's too song based and too commercial for mm. me uh, compared to the story of I. Fair enough. All right, moving on. Um, oops. I'm going to talk about a few more of Steve's. We had mentioned this one. It's pretty much in the same ballpark as the first album, kind of a. But less singing. Yeah, less yeah. singing, but uh, still kind of a bunch of unrelated songs that, that come together as an album. But a couple of nice acoustic numbers that are in the vein of mood for a day does this have second initial on it or service tension yeah yeah okay yeah that's a good one I like that um and then you know this is the album they did right around the time of union and two of the tracks wound Actually, up it's, it's earlier than that it's oh, it, it was it pre that three okay. years to be released it, it's okay. pre a a b w h actually i don't get it you know <laughs> these instrumental rock guitar albums were all in vogue in the 80s you know and this is the same label that Joe Satriani was on when he did Surfing with the Alien, Relativity. And I think, you know, that's probably why it's instrumental. I think that was probably part of the, the deal when they came to him and offered him the deal was to... I'm, I'm not sure because I've read Steve mentioned that he was self-produced and he was after GTR had collapsed and he had no label, no deal, and he just chose to do the album he wanted at that time and, and recorded it with his own... Hmm. Wow. Money and called Bill and and it was later bought by but that's probably part of the delay for it being released was due to it not being contracted in the first place. Yeah, well, I prefer the songs here compared to the versions that wound up on Union. Although I like those songs on Union, I think they're some of the better ones on there. <laughs> but in the long run, I think you know that da 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 is really great on this album. I forget the name, what they call it on this one. It's called, I would have waited forever on union. Mm -hmm. And then um, silent talking has that blah, 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 lick. That's also on this record as well. So, so Hal records this album. Then it sort of gets lost. You know, no one wants to release it. He can't get it out there. So when he's working on what becomes union, he's like, well, I'll use these ideas because they haven't been released. And then somewhat unexpectedly, it ends up getting released just after Union, which is slightly unfortunate in terms of, oh, you can, it's the same material again in, in a few places. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's a strong album, Bill Booth on drums. Um, most of Steve Howell's subsequent albums have had his son, Dylan Howell, on drums. Or occasionally. I think starting with this one. Yeah, yeah well, I never, I don't get on with this album. I no, like it better than I thought I would. You know, I, um, there's a tune on there called The Gates of the New World that I think is right along the lines of it could have been a yes song. You know, it's um, And his singing is much better on here. I don't really mind it on this one. So I think um, it was the whole point for him of making this album is to at last do an album where the vocals were decent enough. I, mean, I think that was a challenge he set for himself because the, the, the vocals are a big part of uh, of the album uh, it's not so strong that uh, as strong as turbulence in terms of of uh, guitar playing and uh, it's close though and it has a, a focused kind of sound yeah, to it where that all the songs kind of hang together nicely and there's a really cool steel string acoustic tune called valley of the rocks kind of a clap part two in a way uh really nice stuff so Anyhow, and I sh we mentioned Asia before, so we will gloss over them fairly quickly. But um, again, Jeff Downs and Steve Howe, right out, fresh out of drama, hit pay dirt with, uh, with Asia. And, uh, you know, heat of the moment and only time will tell. We're all over MTV. And brought Jeff them Downs has this 
amazing period in his career where he goes from a number one with the Buggles. He goes into Yes, they have a, a, a UK number two album. And then he comes into Asia and this is the, the best selling album of 1982. I mean, this was a hugely successful period for Jeff. Um, and the beginning of Asia, a band that would run for many more years. Absolutely. Um, you know, the debut album, I think, is my favorite. I think it's solid every track. The next one, I think there was some internal conflict that kind of watered it down. I think Howe and Wetton were not getting along. Howe and Wetton were arguing. Wetton leaves. They get Craig Lake in. Then that doesn't work out. And they get Wetton back. But, but also, Asia begins as a, an excuse for Howe and Wetton to write together. Steve brings Jeff into the band. Jeff and John Wetton hit it off and end up writing most of the first album, although there's still several How Wetton tunes. But by this point, you know, the, the record company was like, oh, it's the Downs Wetton songs that do well. And so this is all Downs Wetton songs. I mean, I, 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 I like Alpha. I think it's a great album. But yeah, this is, Steve is getting pushed out of. Um, Pretty much. And that winds up being the last album he's on for decades. Um, yeah. While Asia went on and did many records, um, some of which are, are pretty cool. Uh, I particularly like the artwork on this one. I think it's one of Roger's best um, um, covers, actually. It's a, got a lot of detail. I actually have a framed print of this where you can see the whole thing. And there's a lot of detail. There's even like a tiger lurking in the, in the shadows if you look really closely. You can see him kind of looking, not on here, it's on the back. Yeah. Anyway, um, eventually they do a reunion and they do a trio of albums and a number of tours. I saw a couple of these tours and it was just a treat to kind of see them all together again. Um, even though I wasn't totally enamored with this new material, there were a few tracks on each album that I thought were pretty cool. Um, I, I thought the best tracks on these albums were were the Steve Howe tracks. I, I think he's got a number of great songs, um, uh, like "The Way in My Veins." Uh, um, that that track of his on the first album, um, which I've completely forgotten the name of. Oh, I know the one you're talking about, and it reminds. I wish I'd known all along. That's it. It reminds me of the bonus track that wound up on fly from here later um mm. it's it kind of written in that vein is what it makes me think of um, you know and it's interesting that that this is a sort of how we're having ideas for these sort of rockier songs which aren't perhaps so suitable for yes and also with with often quite dark lyrics compared to what his lyrical approach in yes that's a good point. You know, there's an interesting song cycle on Phoenix, which was the first album that they did as a reunion. That's pretty good. I forget. There's a tune on a kind of instrumental that Jeff did called Deja. And I forget hmm. the rest of it, but that was like a three song cycle that was kind of ambitious and, and pretty neat. Um, I don't recall anything like that on the following two records, but they were pretty cool. I mean, it was nice to see them live, you know, in a little, little venue that probably held about 500 people. So, yeah. So moving on, um, other yes offshoots, you know, this one, I'm sure Asia set the stage and there was hope of recapturing that kind of uh, success, but it just didn't really happen with this band. It, I mean, they sold quite well. Um, I mean, they only had one hit, so. Yeah, well, it's not too bad. That's I mean, I, GPR <laughs> gets a lot of abuse. Um it, it is, it has a sound uh, of its time. Uh, we should say this is the, 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 the whole point of GTR is it's Steve Howe and Steve Hackett together. Jeff Downs is involved, but as the producer, and, and he wrote one of the songs for Hunter, but he's not playing keyboards. Um, I, I like GTR. Um, I, you know, I think there's some, there's some nice guitar playing. There's some there's there's some great riffs, uh, but it but it is it does have a somewhat dated sound. True. Um, when the heart rules the mind, you know that's a really good one. You know, I, I was chatting with Hackett a few weeks ago, and we talked a bit about it, and he said, you know, that he, you know, Steve wrote the intro, and he thought that was fantastic, but he wasn't really crazy about the rest of it. So he kind of wrote the verses and the chorus and put it all together, and he said that was really the best song that they did together and 
And it's a good catchy one. I thought it was well done and it had a kind of a proggy underpinning somewhat. I remember seeing the video on MTV originally and thinking, hmm, this could really be something. But um, it didn't really, you know, kind of sputtered to a stop before it. Yeah, now Hackett and Howe had differing views, really, of, of what was going to happen. Oh, I'm sure. Um, and they both kind of try and do follow ops on their own, uh, which which don't really go anywhere. Um, Steve Howe keeps most of the band, um, gets Robert Berry involved. Uh, some of those songs, Robert Berry used, some of the songs uh, eventually got sort of dug out again and stuck on um, Steve Howe's Anthology 2 compilation. Hmm. There's a few songs on there which are late GTR tracks. Did you say, you mentioned Robert Berry. Wasn't he involved with a a second version of GTR. Yeah, yeah. I thought so. Okay. So, so he's brought in as a sort of uh, additional person. Yeah. Um, Talented chap, that Robert Berry. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work out with GTR. He he's got a solo album, and I think it's got a couple of his yeah, pil pilgrimage to a point. I think he's got yeah. some leftovers from three as well. Yeah. And of course, he, he's recently do, done some uh, follow-ups to the three concept. Yeah, yeah good stuff. As a matter of fact, my band opened for his group when they toured last time. Oh, did it? Nice. It was a, a really delightful night of Prague. Uh, my band, his band, and another local group of 20-somethings that are awesome. They're called The Great Wide Nothing. They have a new album called Hymns for Hungry Spirits that I highly suggest if you want some modern Prague from a younger generation you know they're carrying so it wasn't the uh, tonar orchestra we saw a black and white picture of in one of your previous oh my great grandfather's uh, <laughs> oh, my grandfather's orchestra no but one day i'm going to put my own together so uh, just to uh, stand by for that one and if i'm lucky i'll get billy sherwood to play bass but if not i so, need to do it no. i think conspiracy is is a interesting story so so steve and chris meet at the end of the 80s and and they start writing together and and um derek shulman's trying to push billy into being into yes and we've talked about that and that didn't work out but chris and billy continue working together and so around 92 they they do a tour as the the chris squire experiment and yeah i saw that and most of this material was on that tour, although I think on the tour it's kind of stretched out more. Um, you, you can hear boots at the tour. None of them sound great in audio quality, but, but you can hear the material. And then, they, and then they just spent ages not quite finishing this album. You know, this is Chris Squire. He, this is what he can be like. You know, I um, think I mentioned that, you know, I saw the tour, which was very brief, and... Um, that I went to Tower Records like every month for the next two years and asked when that Chris Squire album is going to be out. And of course, it, never <laughs> and it was came. more like eight years. And so also, you know, all this long period of we've mentioned where Chris Squire talks about I'm doing another solo album. He means this album and, you know, which they're slowly working towards. And before and, and then it's announced it's going to be called Chemistry. It's going to be announced. Uh, it's going to come out. But then yes nick two songs for open your eyes so open your eyes was uh from this album and in fact uh, uh, there's a version of it on this album and i think it was our uh, man in the moon so so that puts back the release again and then eventually this album comes out years later to, to when it was written and recorded um but i think i, I think there's some good material on here um yeah that violet Purple Rose, I believe it's called, it has some well, really that, nice playing. That's things. interesting because because that's the one song that isn't really a, a Squire Surety thing. That's a thing where Chris did some sessions with um Steve Stevens. Yeah, but we don't know if they did more. It's unclear, but but they did this instrumental piece, and then Billy takes that and 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 adds some stuff on top of it. You know, Steve Stevens. You know, he's Billy Idol's guitar player, and you know, he's a great rock guitar player, but he's actually a, has some amazing flamenco chops, and you kind of hear a bit of that on this particular song. And yeah, it's the one that kind of stands out in my memory. But there's lots of cool stuff on this record. Lonesome Trail, I like. Wish I knew is 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 I think a great song. 
Did you like Wish I Knew bef better before it became Open Your Eyes? I, I like the Yes version. Um, but I also like the um, Chris Cryer Experiment live version. Uh, but yeah. the Chris Cryer Experiment did Wish I Knew. Um, but they didn't have material for an encore. And, and Billy tells the story that Chris was like, oh, it's fine. We'll just play Wish I Knew again. They and, did. You know, I so saw it. At the shows. I saw it. And it was interesting because it was like a, getting a glimpse at, yes, five years in the future. But we just didn't know it at the time. Um, so it was interesting, interesting little tour. I wish they would officially release one of those shows because I think people would really like it. But I, you know, know. I don't know if there's any good recordings. Yeah, I mean, nothing really pro. Nothing really. But pro. most of the dates, but they're not great in quality. So anyhow, Alan White, he actually did another album where it was more like a band, I guess, and he got together with Jeff Downs for this, right? Maybe fifteen so, years yeah. ago. Henry so Alan. The, had, and some other Yes people had, had done a little bit of work with a band called Treason, led by a guy called Ted Stockwell. And then they were, you know, from the Seattle area, there was this other local band called Macabre, and, and Alan knew them. And, and somehow they sort of all came together, and there was this plan for a sort of Macabre Treason crossover album with Alan. But they decide in the end, you know, let's let's call it white, because, you know, I think because he's he's the the big name here. Sure. So, so Alan wrote some of the material, but it's got a lot of the macabre people as well. Um, and and they start working on an album and then Ted Stockwell falls out with the rest of the band. And so they they bring Jeff Downs in pretty much at the sort of last minute to record this this album that was then released. Very cool. And uh, how is it? Is it poppy? Is it proggy? Does it sound like Asia? What's it sound like? It's 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 in that sort of poppy proggy area you know, uh, that you know, like some of Squack It or Conspiracy, like a lot of Asia. Um, it's got it, its own stat sound. The the macabre people are are, are bringing some influences to it. So it's it's more poppy than proggy, but the songs aren't aren't straightforward. They they have their complexities. Okay, very cool. So moving on. So enter Trevor Rabin, the young. So we're jumping back in time a long yeah, way. We are going quite a bit, but uh, um, so Trevor Rabin, he's 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 this young guy in South Africa, and and based around him yeah, is the formation of this band called Rabbit and their first uh, piece of music is, is a cover of Jethro Tull's locomotive breath of all things. Yeah, pretty heavy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're successful and they're huge. They're massive sellers in, in South Africa. Um, there's this really famous thing where the Spice Girls met Nelson Mandela at a concert, but, but the thing about that, you know, is in the background is is you see the rabbit people because they're so huge in South Africa, the rest of the world doesn't care, but you know, they got invited along um for for photos. So this was a hugely popular band. Um, you know, in many ways, uh, you know, you could some people might be tempted to sort of dismiss this as sort of juvenilia from from Trevor Rabin. It's 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 commercial. Um, uh, it's it's screaming girls, a sort of boy band thing. But I think there's some good stuff here. That you know, it's very led by by Trevor. Um, some of the albums have all sorts of sort of wacky influences in them. You know, there's bits which are sort of those Beatles ish. There's there's sort of bits of the albums away from the singles, which are sort of you know al almost Python esque in 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 sort of doing wacky humorous bits. Yeah. And you I know, think I quite like Rabbit. A few songs surfaced later. I know the song um, "Hold On to Love" wound up on "Can't Look Away," one of his solo albums down the road. Um, so some of the things got reworked, and he did a series of solo albums, which were kind of in the arena rock vein, I suppose. It's not a far cry from some of the stuff he's doing with Yes, but not super proggy, but um, I think this is the one he did, his third solo album, Wolf. I think this had uh, Jack Bruce on it. Yeah. And 
some other folks. Yeah, so he so he leaves South Africa because of apartheid. Um, comes to the UK, then goes to the US, then comes back to the UK. Um, and along the way, he makes a series of solo albums, you know, and I think the, uh, the, the labels hope he'll be, uh, you know, a big thing and he doesn't really break through. Uh, he opens for a Steve Hillage tour, interestingly. That would have been interesting to hear. Yeah. So um, Mozi's in Yes, he has su his successes and we kind of get to know his sound and, you know, he does a solo album around 1989 called Can't Look Away, which I think, I wouldn't call it a lost 80s Yes album, but it's in the ballpark um, if you like Trevor's yeah, writing. I mean, I think, I think if you like the Trevor Rabin of 9015 and Big Generator, this is the closest you're going to get. Um, good, good point. Yeah. There's some really nice stuff on here. Um, it's a bit of its time production wise, but then again, so are those records, but, uh, yeah, some pretty great stuff. Eyes of love is, is, a, is a kind of a little Epic on there. And, um, there's an interesting instrumental called sludge. That's kind of fun. Uh, there's some kind of little funk kind of tunes. Like I didn't think it would last. Um, Alan white guests on a, a tune called promises. And I think one other one, uh, cover up, I think it was so, yeah, pretty good stuff. I like it. Um, and of course, if you want a glimpse at how some of the songs on 90125 and Big Generator and Talk had their genesis, this is kind of a record of demos that Trevor did, um, including that wonderful version of Owner with the farty synth bass that I mentioned. And, um, and it's interesting to see how some of these songs got reworked, like Owner of a Lonely Heart used to have a pre-chorus that had some really banal lyrics um, and turned the whole thing into kind of a top-down summer anthem. And of course, Horn reined all that in and turned it into the sophisticated pop nugget we know of. But Yeah, I think what's interesting... Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say that this album is interesting in, in showing how Trevor Rabin's material uh, was turned into a more interesting music both by Yes, turning it proggier, and by Trevor Horn, turning it more original and interesting production-wise. Uh, so these are rough ideas that are much like Trevor's early albums that are a bit uh, uh, unoriginal, in a way, a stadium rock. And uh, I think he... He's a very talented guy, obviously, with lots of ideas and, uh, and, uh, and a great guitarist and great keyboard player and singer. But uh, he was, I mean, he was all the better for the uh, for his material that he, he got together with uh, Yes and Trevor Horn. Very true. I think this album really showcases just what they brought to the table um, by it not being here. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, and then, you know, he did an instrumental album, you know, for a while you know he did soundtracks for many years after he left after talk um and there was talk of an instrumental jazz record and i thought well that seems kind of weird for him because he's not really a jazz guy although he's capable of playing convincingly in pretty much any style he sets his mind to but this turned out to be actually kind of a, a proggy kind of instrumental album kind of informed by his soundtrack work and um, it also kind of reminded me of almost of something like maybe Steve Morse from the Dixie Dregs would do, you know, this kind of rather orchestrated um, instrumental guitar album. And he had the likes of Vinnie Caliuta guest on some of this. I mean, some of this stuff is more prog than the stuff he wrote with Yes. And supposedly he told me that, you know, John Anderson loved it when he heard it and just wanted to sing on it and put it out as another Yes album. But... <sighs> You know, well, so, so, yeah. no, supposedly the story he's told is that John Anderson did John Anderson did sing all over it and sent it back to him and went, look, I've done this. And Trevor was like, uh, I didn't ask you to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a great album. Um, I mean, yeah, we, we've skipped over this long period where Trevor Rabin's working doing film scores. And so he does a lot of music, but it, it, it's, it's film scores. It, it's obviously of a, of a certain... Uh, genre. Yeah, I think there's some some better and worse scores in that if if people are interested in, in Ray Bin's career. And then yeah, this is a great album. It's 
exciting playing, really interesting composing. Um, those elements of, 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 of Rabin's work that you get flashes of before, um, of, of Rabin more as a jazz player, come through. Very recommended. Yeah, yeah I think it's one of the stronger albums we've discussed tonight. It's, it's really easily in the top 10 of what we discussed. So a wonderful surprise. Certainly my favorite Trevor Rabin uh, album, not being a huge fan of, of what he brought to the band generally. I mean, I'm, I'm admittedly a, a fan of the uh, 70s incarnation of Yes more than anything. But this is really, really great stuff. So I recommend it to anyone who isn't entirely convinced by Trevor Rabin. Uh, they probably like it. Yeah, it's it's really surprising, and it really raised a lot of hopes for the ARW album that never materialized. You know, it's like if you can write some stuff of this caliber with John and Rick, that would be a hell of a great record. But that never came to be, unfortunately. Um, so we're getting down to the wire here. Uh, Billy Sherwood, you know, he. Uh, we so Billy. About Billy's first band he's in is is really his elder brother's band with Jimmy Horn called Logic, which which he ends up joining as well, and and they record an album with some of the Toto people producing, um, which which sets up this this um, Michael Sherwood and Steve Picaro then worked together for for many many years. Um, Steve Picaro's solo album uh, from a few years back as Michael Sherwood all over it. But then um, Billy leaves, Logic falls apart. This is Billy's next band, World Trade. Um, it's, it's, it's yes, Westy. It, it's kind of in that sort of pop prog territory. I think this is a great debut. Uh, Bruce Gowdy on guitar, Guy Allison on, on keyboards uh, are both good. Does Chris Squire guest on this record? No, on the not on this one. No. So I think this album is before Billy meets Chris. Chris then guests on the, the follow-up, Euphoria. He's on a couple of tracks uh -huh. on it. Okay, very cool. And then other Billy bands that came down the pike a little later, I'd say this is one of the most notable ones that had... So, yeah. so Billy had done various projects, um, lots of tribute albums, and you'd often get Yes Members to Guess, and he comes up with this idea to do a what's going to be called something like the Yes Family, where he's going to get lots of Yes Members together to do original Yesy music, and Pete Banks was going to be involved, and Jeff Downs was going to be involved. But instead, it evolved to become more of a coherent band consisting of Billy, Alan White, Tony Kay, with the guitar filled by Jimmy Horn. Jimmy Horn uh, had been in Logic, uh, was, was uh, friends with Michael Show with Billy's older brother. Jimmy Horn used to babysit the, the little baby Billy. Um, and Jimmy, of course, had ended up playing a lot of the guitar parts on Union. So we get this album and and there's also two songs on here that Billy had written with Trevor Rabin somewhere around the mid 90s under somewhat unclear circumstances. Um, so we get Billy Sherrod, Alan White, Tony Kay from Yes, Jimmy Horn, who's played on a Yes album, and a bit of Trevor Rabin influence, although uh, it, it's not clear whether would have liked to have got Trevor Rabin guesting on it, although he doesn't, but he does at these songwriting credits. Yeah. And yeah, um, Look Inside, which I think is one of the songs Rabin's credited as co-writing. Great song. Lovely Tony K keyboard solo on it. Yeah, it was just nice to see Tony K back in the fray. You know, I think that's one yeah. of my favorite things about this band. Um, which one, might... one of the best things Billy Sherwood has done in his entire career is get Tony Kay out of retirement and back playing with Circle and some other projects. Absolutely agree. And, um, and I, you know, they did a, a number of albums as Circa and with different members. And this is the only one that has Alan on it. Yeah. And um, I thought it was, you know, it had a lot of potential, you know, it's kind of in that Trevor Rabin 80s pop 
vain, I would say, more than anything else. I always thought that Billy was kind of inspired by Trevor or maybe or just happened to have a similar pop sensibility. I'm not sure. So um, the, the, the constant in Circle is, is Billy Sherwood and Tony Kay, and, and the other players have, uh, have changed a lot. Um, and I think some of the sort of mid mid period Soko albums get a bit samey, but their most recent one, Valley of the Windmill, um, yeah. is 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 I think one of their best, and it's their proggiest. Um, it goes back to some longer pieces. Um, I think it's wonderful to have, you know, it's it's not you know a, a lot of Billy Sherwood's projects like the Prog Collective or the Fusion Syndicate. They have these different names, but they're basically Billy doing everything. Circa has a lot of Tony in it as well. And I think he brings a lot to the to the composing and the playing as well. Very so cool. yeah, I uh, this was a strong album. Yeah, this has like a 20 minute epic on it, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. A couple uh, of really long tracks. Yeah. yeah. And, and they're pretty successful. They work well. That's good. And then speaking of Billy offshoots, the hottest new yes shoot offshoot on the block, Arc of Life. So we have this 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 brand new offshoot, which um, Billy Sherwood, it's John Davison from from the current lineup of Yes. It's Jay Shellen, who's the the live drummer, the, the main live drummer for Yes, and then Jimmy Horn again uh, on guitar. And you know, I think when this was announced. A lot of people were like, well, is, is this the future of Yes? You know, at some point, Steve Howe and Jeff Downs will retire. Um, is this what Yes becomes? And um, a lot of the promo for the album was, you know, obviously stressing the Yes connections because that's how you sell an album. Billy, in interviews, had, has talked about how this album came about from him and John just writing together and they weren't trying to do a yes -y thing. And they, you know, it went off in its own direction. Although it's interesting that John, in a recent interview, kind of says the, that they did offer this material to the band, but the band at that point weren't looking to make an album. Um, so, yeah, we get um, Billy John, uh, Jimmy Horn on guitar, Dave Kirstner, um, who, of course, has appeared on, on the More Than One Soul show, um, we could, should, of course, also say the best Arc of Life interview was done with Sean uh, a few episodes ago. Well, thank, uh, you. thank you. That was a fun one. Uh, and we get this this new album, Arc of Life. I'm not so keen on it. I think Valley of the Windmill is the better album. I think I think Billy's most recent prog collective album, Worlds and Hold, is is better. Uh, this one. Uh, I think is 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 one of the weaker products from the from from Billy Sherwood's many many releases. Um, I'm interested what a second album will be like. Um, you know, I think uh, the first album's all Billy and John writing together, and some of it's really just Billy writing on his own. Um, it would be interesting to hear more from Dave Kurtzner, who's a great great player, great writer, great singer. Uh, and also Jimmy Horn, who's an interesting writer. Oh, yeah, an excellent guitar player. I'd say that his solos are the highlight of this record. He, you know, he injects some really fiery playing. There's, um, there's, there's a mix of songs. You know, the album sort of begins with some shorter, poppier songs. It's then got some longer pieces, which I think are more interesting. I agree. Yeah, it, it's, it's not bad. I, I enjoyed what I've heard. Um, you know, again, it's, it's very Billy-esque. And I think the next album could have a equal, you know, writing from everybody that will make it more well-rounded. But yeah, it's cool. It's cool to see that they're um, at it, you know, again in some capacity, you know. Um, so what about this Badger? This is one I haven't heard. I always liked the album cover. I thought it looked great. Oh, it's a great album. One Life Badger is a really good album. Um, so this is Tony Kay Leaves Yes, Forms Badger, um, but Badger was supporting Yes, end up supporting Yes, and 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 so they uh, at the Rainbow, yeah, yeah, the Rainbow, so Yes he, songs. They they had the mobile studio available, of course, uh, doing the Yes songs film and and recording. So uh, John uh, was still in contact with Tony, and uh, 
and offered uh, to, to, to let them record the album and ended up being the producer for the album. And of course, the, uh, the basis of, uh, of Badger was Tony getting together with David Foster, who was uh, a former associate of uh, John Anderson, both in The Warriors and as a songwriting partner for uh, a couple of songs on the early albums and uh, supposedly yours is no disgrace the basis of which is supposed to be uh, anderson foster uncredited yeah. collaboration and uh, they ended up getting together with uh, brian parish and roy dyke so brian parish was from the parish gervitz army uh, some of which featured alan white actually huh? on studio albums so there's uh, the family tree gets complicated. Indeed, it's uh, the interesting thing about this album from a keyboard point of view is that Tony uh, doesn't just play Hammond. He's quite comfortable playing uh, Mellotron and, and Moog as well as uh, as Hammond, which supposedly he couldn't bear doing in, in Yes. So it's quite inter interesting that he got in, interested in uh, other keyboards after leaving Yes. Mm, interesting. Now, is this album live or is that merely the name of it? One. Yeah, no, it's live. It's live. Live at the okay. Rainbow Theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you just said that. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. Okay. Already. And, and, and then, I think it's an it's an interesting album because it sort of it sort of gives an idea of of what Tony K brought to Yes and how Yes could have gone. It's it's a bit foggy. It's it's a bit funky in a way. But um, Tony doesn't seem to drive the band. I mean, songwriting wise, it's all David Foster and Brian Parrish writing the material. So it's, it's, it's not a K driven band. It's from that. credited to, every, apart from one song, it's credited to the whole band. Oh. How much? I mean, in practice. I, I think, think I've read interviews where, where, where it was made clear that there was some existing material that both Foster and Parrish brought. Yeah. I don't think. Tony had, I mean, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of composing from a keyboard player in the, in the music, really. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right that it's probably um, mostly coming from Parrish and Foster, but they do all get credits. And, yeah, and I think Tony contributes to the sound. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas Detective. Yeah, what's going on here? Um, L.A. Yeah, LA, lots of LA. Um, Tony did a recent Rolling Stone interview and he sort of talks about this period. Um, and what you get is a sort of mid 70s rock album of not a huge amount of note. Yeah, pretty much, you know, but it's interesting to show kind of what Tony was doing in the late 70s. Yeah. You know, there it Let's is. Post yeah. him uh, touring with Bowie and. Uh, the, the band was managed by Peter Grant, I believe. Uh, so it was it yeah. was on the Led Zeppelin uh, kind of roster. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy Page had some involvement in the first album, right? I think he might have, yeah. You know, this has uh, Michael DeBar yeah. as the yeah. front man. And, you know, yeah. his wife Pamela was with Jimmy before she met him. So there's your connection. <laughs> um, Peter Banks, you know, he has a, a pretty cool stash of solo albums. And this is his first one. And, and the only one from the 70s, actually. Yeah. And I so believe his, John, his, his other solo albums came out 20 years later. Uh, so that was in the middle of his run with uh, Flash. Yeah, so uh, he uh, forms this band, Flash, Tony K, I guess, on the first album. And then at, at the end of Flash, um, he, he does this solo album, which has a fantastic set of guest stars on it. Um, John, John Weston, Jan Ackerman. Yeah, from Focus. So Jan Ackerman is quite heavily involved, but John Wetton only plays on, I think, a, a one-minute track yeah. or something. Phil I Collins mean, Wetton, uh, plays on, the, on uh, the Long Jam on side two. Wetton, when asked about the album in, in uh, more recent years, but um, had no memory even of having yeah. done it. <laughs> Yeah, so one, tra one short track does have Steve Hackett, John Wetton, and Phil Collins on it. So that's quite impressive. But it's, it's really anecdotal in the end because the, the bulk of the album is, uh, is well, Pete himself and, and his collaboration yeah. with Jan Ackerman is the most significant, I think. And, yeah. of course, uh, the flash rhythm section uh, play on it. So it's all instrumental, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's 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 a great album. I mean, it's been criticized by even by Pete himself because the second side is is more of a jam kind of thing, and he didn't have the time to to write to compose music, so it ended up being this this jam. But overall, it's a, it's a really strong uh, album, I think. Very cool. Yeah, they're running out of time to make the album while also making Flash. Yeah. So Flash had a series of albums with some. Risque covers. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, how would you describe this band's music? Well, it's very I mean, much in the vein of early yes. Yeah. With a different sounding vocalist. Lots of guitars. Lots of flashy guitars. <laughs> yeah, very cool. And flashy covers. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, I think there's a lot of the good flash stuff um, that, that's worth checking out. Um, a uh, quite nice live album that came out not too long ago. Very good. Very good. Well, gentlemen, I, in the end, brevity is never our, our friend when we do this, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, I'm going to chop it in half and I'm going to do the live ones as one episode and the solo ones as its own episode. I think that'd be a, a good way to go with this one. So um, are there any solo albums that I overlooked that, come oh. to the forefront of your mind that we should have talked about? Maybe. Uh, a, couple, a couple of John Anderson solo albums. I think Toltec uh, is one of the stronger albums from the 90s, as well as Change We Must, which was his uh, orchestral album uh, from around the same time, which I think is, uh, is a really pleasant listen. So with some Absolutely. strong melodies, uh, some John and Vangelis. Uh, songs and a couple of uh, I mean it has hearts by yes done in a different way so that's uh, that's uh, a nice one uh, as well so that's two that pop up in my mind Henry you have any you want to add to the pile um, I think there's some later Steve Howe solo albums of the very good time his sort of semi-classical one is is fantastic from from not that long ago um uh, we haven't talked about sort of bill bruford later with his jazz group earthworks where he he has this phase where he's doing electronic instrumentation that sort of earthworks mark one and then earthworks reappears with a sort of more traditional acoustic band it should be said uh, speaking um, of earthworks that it's it's if you hate Bill Bruford's electronic drums with Yes, you should listen to early Earthworks because I think they're used in a more uh, interesting way in that context. So it, 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 they're not, they don't deserve the total hate that they get, that they get for Bill using them. In no, the no I think, you know, in just about any context but Yes music, Bill did really unique things with them. You know, with King Crimson, he was cutting edge. And uh, with the early earthworks, yeah, it's quite musical. You know, it's 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 not the intrusion that it becomes when you play it on close to the edge or whatever. I think um, uh, Pete Banks, uh, since his death, uh, the Peter Banks estate has done a number of sort of re-releases of of his live material. You know, in these sort of very reasonably priced sort of multi CD box sets collecting it together and there's some nice stuff there there's a there's an anthology called be well be safe be lucky which is part anthology from their solo albums but also has various rarities that didn't fit anywhere else and there's some really good stuff on that that I think is nice um and his um his later band Omni and Diversity there's a collection of all of that um with Andrew Booker perhaps better known these days as the sanguine hum drummer uh, okay. was the other leading force in there. Um, there's, there's the yeah, Mabel yeah. Greer's toy shop uh, yeah. release of, of their early BBC and related recordings, which has that early version of uh, Beyond and Before. And they did yeah. uh, some, uh, some albums uh, with a reformed version of the band as well, with Tony Kaye and Billy Sherwood appearing on there debut album that's another interesting one for the family tree <laughs> okay i think um jeff downs in recent years has, has had this band of chris braid the the downs braid association um who just put out halcyon hymns that's their fourth studio album 
some great stuff on there, kind of a sort of like a modern version of the Buggles, maybe. Um, uh, Igor Horoshev's one solo album, which is pretty much impossible to find these days, called Piano Works. Great album if you can find it. Uh, Trevor Horn. We haven't talked about Trevor Horn enough. Trevor Horn's done solo albums more recently. He, he's got this soundtrack album for this Stanley animation. It's quite fun. He, he did an album of orchestral 80s songs recently that's, that's good. Uh, he did the producer's album with, um, with Chris Grade, which is how Chris Grade met um, Jeff Downs. Um, Lowell Creme, Lowell Cream from 10CC. Uh, and other people, and that producer's album is fantastic. And, and Trevor Horn is working through the the, the loss of his wife, um, who, who had a tragic accident, who was in a coma for many years before dying. And there's some really moving material on, on that producer's album, Made in Basing Street. Um, Oliver Waitman has has done some quite fun stuff, you know, solo albums. If if, if you like Rick, you might like Oliver. Um, uh, Tom Brislin, hurry up and smell the roses. Great. Tom Brislin, or I mean, I prefer um, the Sea Within, which has John Anderson briefly guesting on it. Oh uh, yeah, Tom kind of a modern prog supergroup. Yeah, w which is connected to the invention of knowledge, which yeah. is one year's fault and John Anderson together. Which is that's a noteworthy on. album to mention. I thought that turned yeah. out quite well. It was more of the I, I thought it was really good. It, it reminds me of Yes a lot. But half the people who listen to it hate it. I, you know, it seems to be a love-hate album, that one. Um, I don't hate it. I mean, it didn't really, not a lot stuck with me. But I, at the time, I thought, you know, this is, it's great to hear John back with a full rock band. You know, that was kind of the return of John Anderson after his yeah, Certainly very yes -y, And I think the intention was uh, for him to... Uh, to claim as the yes legacy uh, against the uh, the uh, official yes, uh, the the only disappointing aspect of the album is uh, is that there's not enough instrumental moments in there. I think a uh, lot of was, was a bit in, intimidated by uh, working with uh, his idol John Anderson that he didn't dare. Uh, doing much that was personal and it, it was mostly to serve yeah. John's vocals. Right. Uh, so that's the, the weak point of the album for me. And I hope they get the balance better in that respect. Yeah, I think if it, you do long tracks, it can't be vocal all, all through. Uh, that's yeah. what gets a bit tiring with that album. I think I heard that there's another one in the works or. Yeah. Yeah. So. Anyway. We'll see and then the, the last album I'd like to mention is the Levin Torn White album, which oh, again, yeah. there was a recent uh, oh, Story of the Life interview with, um, which was this very surprising project where, where Scott Shaw recorded a bunch of stuff with Anna White. Uh, Tony Levin Jen records over that, yeah, and then they go to um, David Torn. Uh, Torn. Uh, who records over that, you know, it's an odd way to make an album, but it, it, it's fascinating, you know, it's some of Alan's most interesting playing, um, it's very rhythmically interesting, it's uh, all instrumental, great, great album, check out the recent Soul Night Live uh, interview, and uh, then check out the album. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's an interesting parallel is that in that Torn and Levin and the uh, recorded several albums with Bruford. So yeah. it's always, again, interesting. Oh, yeah, and those were excellent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cloud about Mercury. Extremities. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Very King Crimson sounding, obviously, yeah. but in a really good way. Kind of like if King Crimson's rhythm section from the 80s jammed with Miles Davis and David Torn. And David Torn is another mad scientist kind of guitar player like Baloo and Fripp. So it's he's a perfect foil for that rhythm section i think yeah some of my favorite crim offshoots is that that group yeah. for sure and then, you know i would love to have you guys back sometime to maybe talk about the king crimson catalog i think that might be a, a good episode sometime down the road sure if you would great idea for that yeah absolutely 
All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure getting together and, and talking about some of the greatest classic progressive rock that's been made. And I look forward to another opportunity in the future. So do Lo I. Lovely to um, have you host these sessions. Always a pleasure. Well, well thank you, Emmerich and Henry. Appreciate it. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow with David Sanctious, 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll be watching. Excellent. All right. We'll take care. Mm -hmm.